91. We had almost no rain at all in December and January and February even. And so we thought, well, we're not going to have any wildflowers this year. In March, we had the deluge. It rained all of March. And that year was sensational. The poppies covered four miles along 138 out there. They were just unbelievably beautiful. So, you know, I can't predict the weather and I can't predict the wildflowers. I just take it as they come. And one of the really interesting things is that every year is different. Every year is a new adventure. Every year you go out and you try to find out what's dominant, what, what flower is really going well today and, or this year, and uh, maybe next year you won't see them. For example, up here at Red Rock one year, we had some blazing stars, some beautiful blazing stars just all over the place. When was that, Mark? Do you remember? I know we had them in 91. I think we had 90. them in 95 as well. We yeah. The 95 was a beautiful they were, they were sensational all over. And uh, then I've come up here other times, and we had other good flowers, but those I couldn't find. So the thing is that every flower has its own requirements as to when it blooms, how much water it takes, and so forth. So it's interesting to study, but it's also very, very complicated. I read one article where they're estimating that in a square meter of ground out here in the Mojave Desert, there's some 5,000 dormant seeds. And those seeds are just waiting for the right conditions to come along to germinate and to come forth. Out in the Death Valley area, you know, they've seen seeds out there that have been dormant for 30 years, and all of a sudden they have good year out there and it just bursts forth. For many, many years, it has been the custom of people in Antelope Valley in the spring of the year to go driving out into the poppy fields. And this was back in about 1910. It's a 1910 white automobile. The two people sitting up in the automobile are the two people, Murdy and George Weber, who ran the Western Hotel in Lancaster. Now, if you've been in Lancaster, maybe you've seen on the on uh, Lancaster Boulevard the Western Hotel, which is now a museum. And for many years, it was run by this couple. Murdy Weber died when she was about 107 years old. The California poppy was named the state flower in 1903. And well, it should be, because it certainly is the most spectacular fields of flowers that we have. La Sabinillo de San Pasqual, the altar cloth of San Pasqual, was the name the Spanish sailors gave the glorious fields of poppies in, on the shores of California as they sailed north from San Diego to San Francisco in the late 1700s. Some of the most beautiful fields of poppies were located at what we call now Pasadena, Altadena, and Sierra Madre. Now, the California poppy is not just one poppy. Yes, you'll see California, can, uh, California can, can refer to a, a lot of different flowers. These are annuals, and these are perennials. They come up from the root. They also have seeds and can reseed themselves. But uh, out by the poppy reserve, we see both of them, the perennials and the annuals. But they can be lemon yellow. Uh, some, yesterday, I was out that way, and I saw a big bush of this lemon yellow. They can be variegated colors. There are a great many varieties of uh, different uh, kinds of poppies. And here in Red Rock, there's a hillside that commonly has poppies in a good year. And uh, they seem to be a lot different than the ones we have down there in Antelope Valley. Even ice white ones. I found these up in uh, Tehachapi. And uh, they're spectacular when you find a bush of these very, very white poppies. Now, the poppy does not open up like an upside-down umbrella like a lot of wildflowers do. Instead, it has this cap on it, and the cap comes off and the petals unfurl. 
Now, poppies have four petals, six petals, or eight petals. Uh, the ones up around San Francisco, out on near Point Reyes, uh, look quite a bit different than the ones we have down here, but they're all California Eschiltia. The seed pod you see on the right there, if you're going to pick the seeds, you have to take your thumbnail and open up these seed pods to see if the seeds are black. Now, if you wait too long and you touch that seed pod, it just springs forth and scatters the seed on the ground. Always with the California poppy, which is known botanically as a Schultzia californica, you have this little pink color at the base, which designates all Schultzias. Although the California poppy is not a true poppy, uh, it's uh, in the poppy family. Uh, it isn't quite as narcotic, well, it isn't anywhere near as narcotic as uh, the true poppies. But the Indians would take the foliage and stuff it in the cavities of their teeth for toothaches. Uh, they would uh, take uh, the petals and uh, the Lucenia Indian children would chew them like chewing gum. Uh, but the most interesting one I found use of the California poppy was that the early Spanish felt that it would grow hair. And so they would put suet or uh, some sort of uh, lard in a pan and sprinkle it heavily with the petals of the California poppy and they would uh, simmer it for quite a while until they made a jelly-like substance. Uh, they called it uh, amade, uh, amapola, pomade de amapola. Uh, and uh, they would faithfully rub it into their balding heads. I don't think it was very effective, but anyway, it held the hair down. Uh, over here, we see one of these variegated poppies, which... Uh, you notice growing right next to these very orange poppies, uh, you see this two-tone ones. There's several here. So you'll get quite a mixture uh, in a field. And whether or not those are different uh, subspecies or whether they're just sports, uh, I don't think the botanists have determined yet. In the poppy family, and you can see here are six petals and many stamen, are the cream cups and they grow in the area down there with the poppies around the poppy reserve. The ones I like best are certainly these with the little lemon yellow in the petals. Very pretty little flower and you can see how fuzzy the stems are. Uh, you can't mistake this. Also a true poppy grows down there, highly narcotic, but it would take a considerable more of these than grow down there to do any good uh, harvesting the narcotic part of it. But it's called a prickly poppy and it certainly deserves its name because the foliage is not something you want to fool around with. It is really very prickly. It has a pretty flower very similar to the Matillaha poppy over in the near the Ojai area. Uh, and the Matillaha makes a wonderful uh, landscape shrub if you've got room for it. It's very hard to transplant, but once you get it started, it just takes over and uh, it uh, covers a big area and has these very beautiful flowers, very, very much like this. Sometimes you'll find bush poppy growing in isolated spots, but many times after a fire, you'll see whole hillsides covered with this uh, these bushes and they'll be that way year after year until the chaparral gradually crowds them out. The bush poppy has a seed pod very much like the California poppy, only much smaller. The bush poppy has four petals and many stamen. There's some 78 species of lupin in the state of California, and a great many of them are very difficult to identify as to their species, uh, unless uh, you have the seeds or a microscope and so forth where a botanist can do this. Uh, there are a great many flowers 
lupin that we refer to simply as bush lupin, like the very beautiful flower here. All of the lupin flowers grow on a stalk, and uh, when you examine them, uh, the little tiny flower on the stalk has a banner and a keel, and uh, the pollination occurs when the insect opens up this keel to de deposit the pollen. Now, the early Romans gave the name to this plant. <coughs> they <coughs> saw this plant growing in what they called barren soil. So they concluded that the plant robbed the nutrients from the soil. So they named it lupus after their name for wolf or robber. So later on, not too long after that, they decided that, hey, it doesn't rob the soil. It really puts nutrients into the soil. It's a legume. It provides nitro nitrogen to the soil. Uh, so they, soon after that, the farmers used it as a cover crop. As we do here, we use a lot of legumes as a cover crop for the same reason. Uh, as I said, there are many different lupin here. Have white lupins, two or three varieties of white lupin around. Up at the Hatchaby, they have a white lupin up there that turns a purplish color as it ages. Now, one flower we can identify and know the name of is this uh, royal desert lupin, Lupinus odoratus, and the reason for the name is it smells good. And I've seen literally blocks of Lancaster covered with this flower in the springtime. Uh, now I find it out on 180th Street East, out in the sand dunes. It grows in sandy soil. It's an annual, very beautiful flower. One of the most common lupin in Western Antelope Valley, and one which many people are not even aware of, is called a pygmy leaf lupin. This, this flower covers great expanses of the Western Antelope Valley. But what people usually see are this very small, typical lupin leaf. The flower is only about half an inch high, and so it doesn't make much of a, an Im impression on people as they look across the field. But when you get a close-up shot, it is really a very pretty little flower. Chia. A lot of you know chia by chia dolls, these little plants that you put seeds in and it grows uh, sprouts from it. Well, this was a major food for the Indian. Uh, they would pick the seeds of this, and I'll show you the seed pods in a minute. But the chia is a mint family. It has square stems, and you'll see several of these pods growing right on top of each other. I've seen as many as four or five pods growing on one stalk. This is where the seeds are behind the flowers uh, form the seeds in those pods. And the Indian women in their baskets would go out and pick these and shake the seeds into the basket. Now, you can uh, buy chia seed at health food stores today. It's very nutritious, easily digested, uh, used in a great many ways. They would grind the seed. They would wet it. They would make little cakes out of it to preserve it for winter food, for trade with other Indian tribes. Uh, the early uh, pioneers would use it as a polis on uh, boils or gunshot wounds. Uh, after a hard day's work, uh, uh, ride across the desert, uh, your eyes are all dusty from the dust. They would put a, one of these chia seed under their eyes when they went to bed at night to clean out the dirt in their eyes because when the seeds are put in water, they become a jelly-like substance. The peasant in uh, Mexico makes a little drink called agua de chia. They would put water, mix it up, put the seed in, a little lemon, a little cinnamon, 
and they would have agua de chia, a very favorite drink of theirs. When the miners came to California in 1849 to mine for gold, they had a very meager diet of bacon and beans. They observed the Indians eating this green stuff, and it soon became known as Indian lettuce and later miners' lettuce. Uh, they would pick it and eat it raw in salads, or they would uh, boil it and have beans and greens. It's a very interesting plant with a flower blooming right out of the center of the leaf. Uh, when it first comes out, it has this long strap leaf, but later it develops uh, these, some of which can become quite large. Mormon tea. There's a lot of Mormon tea or ephedra around here. Uh, this is a very primitive plant, and uh, it has uh, male and female. This is the male. The colorful one is the male. And uh, I took a group of students out, and I pointed out that you can always tell the male because it's the colorful one. And the teacher said, yeah, but look at the female when it has much better form. And anyway, uh, my mother used to boil this stuff up as a tea because it was supposed to cure your cold. And I don't know, I suppose it's as good a cold cure as anything around. Your cold goes away in five to seven days, and that's it. But uh, it is, the Indians would uh, bunch this stuff up and put it in their springs to sweeten up the alkali springs, uh, various uses of it. And in some places, you can buy this for tea today. Wild rhubarb. When I was a boy out in the Wilson area, out near the Indian Museum, the neighbor ladies would go out and harvest the stalks of this stuff. Just like domestic rhubarb, the leaves and the uh, flowers are poisonous, but the stalk is edible. And uh, they would can it. They called it pie plant. And they would can it and make pies out of it later on. Well, my wife tried it. And I've got to tell you, it's a very poor substitute for rhubarb. <laughs> the... Uh, Roots were very high in tannic acid, and uh, some commercial uh, companies tried to grow this as a substitute for the tan bark oak so they could tan leather with it. But they irrigated it, and the tannic acid in the root dropped from 25% to 5% to less. And so it was commercially, it didn't work out. To me, one of the most beautiful flowers around is this desert mariposa lily. Uh, a couple of years ago, in 95, a friend of mine and I went up in this caravan up here at uh, Ridgecrest to go out and see the pictographs. And you have to drive some, I don't know, 25 miles from the headquarters up there. And he's, he was a botanist. And we got out there, and we couldn't stop. You had to start at the entrance and you had to stop at the pictographs and you couldn't stop anywhere in between. And here were all the fields of these calicordas, this mar uh, desert mariposa. It was more of these mariposas than either he or I had seen in our entire lifetime. They were just all over those fields, almost like poppies. They were fantastically beautiful. And these, you'll notice, have three petals, not four. So don't confuse them with the poppies. But they're a lily family, they grow from a bulb. And uh, sometimes when they grow out in the open like this, they're only about four or five inches high. But when they grow up through a desert shrub, they may be 18 inches, two feet high, uh, looking for the sun before they open up with their blossom. Now, there are a great many of the calicordas around. Mariposa, the common name, means butterfly in Spanish. And if you look at this, uh, this uh, mariposa, you can understand why they got its name. One of the most beautiful ones up in the hills above on the south side of Antelope Valley to me is this golden mariposa lily. You'll find them down in Vasquez Rocks and uh, in the mountainous area, and they're truly a really beautiful flower. Also, having a bulb 
And by the way, those Mariposa lilies, the Indians found a way of harvesting the bulbs because the bulbs are edible. Uh, and they would harvest them so that they would still have more to grow back the next year. And a lot of the disagreements between the Indians and the early pioneers, the pioneers wanted to farm the land and the Indians wanted to protect their food materials, the calicortis or the mariposas there. Uh, these are wild onions. Uh, and they smell like onions, they taste like onions, they've got to be onions. There are two kinds we have, the white one and the, uh, the red one and the white one. You've heard the story about uh, the guy who discovered gold down in Placerita Canyon, uh, pulled up some wild onions, and on the roots he saw some uh, gold. He discovered gold some six years before Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill. Uh, you get the idea from that story that this vaquero that found this, Francisco Lopez, was a poor peasant, cattle rancher, sheep herder, so forth. Wrong. Francisco Lopez got a mining engineering degree from University of Mexico, and he knew what he was looking for. Uh, he was a well-educated man, and uh, so that he knew gold when he saw it. But I have to warn everybody, unless people know what they're looking for, uh, unless they have permission to dig it, uh, so forth and on and on, don't. Because some bulbs, some things that you might think are edible are deadly poisonous. And out in the Wilsona area near Saddleback Butte State Park, we have this plant which is called zigadine, desert zigadine, and the bulb is really very poisonous. And here we have a jimson weed. Some people consider this to be a plant with a very beautiful flower, and that it is. Some people consider this to be a poisonous, noxious weed, and certainly that it is. But to the Southwest Indian, this was a holy plant, and the medicine man would come out, and he would go through his ceremony, and, oh, holy one, I come to dig thee for good purpose, and he would dig up the root, the plant and the root, he would dry the root, grind it, make a powder out of it, and they use it for their puberty rites. So usually for boys between the age of 9 and 10, and the powder would go into water in a solution, they would drink it, they would go into a coma for about three days. And it was during this period of time that they dreamed about their sacred animal. And whatever that animal was, they would never kill it for the rest of their life. This plant has a seed pod that's very thorny. So some people know this plant as thorn apple. Other people know it as sacred doctora because of the uh, use that the Indians put to it, uh, used in their sacred puberty rites. Jamestown, a uh, jimson weed is a contraction of Jamestown weed because when John Smith landed in uh, Virginia, his sailors found a different species of this stuff and uh, made a tea out of it and it affected them really adversely. So it thereafter became known as Jamestown weed or Jimson weed. Paintbrush. Little plant that looks like <coughs> Looks like somebody just picked it up and dipped it in a bucket of paint. Really hard to figure out where the different parts of the flower are in this, where are the stamens, where are the petals, so forth. Uh, this plant can grow out in the middle of the field alone, but it usually doesn't. It's a semi-parasite, and it hooks its roots onto, usually down our way, onto the buckwheat plant and it gets part of its nutrition from the buckwheat plant. Now, in good years, when we have a lot of rain, we'll get fields of this stuff, and it's called owl's clover. 
And if you use your imagination, you can see two little owl's eyes peering out at you and maybe an owl's beak. It's not a clover. Uh, the Spanish had a much better word for it. They called it Los Escobidos, which means little whisk brooms. And they certainly look like that. Once in a while, you'll find an albino. See all the little owl's eyes peering out at you from way back there? Now, there's a different species that grows out around uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, they don't have white on the tips. They have yellow like this. Still a very beautiful flower. There's a large group of flowers in uh, Antelope Valley and Red Rock Canyon that are evening primrose family. There are two main ones. This one is the California primrose and is a perennial and grows in quite expanses out in the uh, western uh, Antelope Valley. Now up here you get the dune primrose. This is the flower on both of them. Looks very much like this. You can identify it by the cross on the stamen. Uh, now this is the dune primrose. That other was the flower of the California primrose. This is an annual. And <clears throat> the difference is when the California primrose goes to seed, it simply decomposes. But when this one goes to seed, if it forms long branches, it will be like a bird cage. Down in the Anzo Borrego Desert, I've seen these about two feet high, the bird cages, as the limbs curl up and make this funny shaped uh, skeleton of the plant. Both of them very beautiful flowers, and uh, all of them with this cross on the stamen. Similar one, and we saw some out here today, and because of the lack of rain, they haven't done very much. But this is a brown-eyed primrose, a very common flower throughout the uh, Mojave Desert. Up here, Antelope Valley, the eastern part, uh, you'll see this flower. And a lot of people pay not much attention to it. Uh, it's similar to this one. And this one grows over in, in the canyon near the uh, Mariposa Lilies, near the spring over here. And this is called a bottle washer. Now, like the others, when this one goes to seed, it forms this strange looking bottle washer shape. And uh, when it goes brown, you can, well, I found some out there today, some of the skeletons of these little flowers. This plant is called Prince's Plume, mustard family. And like so many of the mustard family, the leaves are edible. The leaves are very strong tasting and the Indians would boil them, cook them, and, uh, but you had to rinse them quite a bit because you would get a little bit nauseated. But the interesting thing about this plant, and it grows up here alongside the road over here, but I've seen them other places, but where I've seen most of them are along the San Andreas fault line. When you go from Leona Valley out to Val Yermo, there in a good year, you'll see these plants all over the place. And on the freeway, as it goes through the fault, you'll see them up on the side of the hills there. Uh, really a very beautiful flower, a large bush-like flower. That's the Palmdale Reservoir in the distance there. Up this way, and uh, really a truly a desert flower, is this apricot mallow. The Indians referred to it as sore eyes because you touch this stuff, the the uh, fuzzy part on the stem and touch your eyes with it and you'll be sorry because uh, the pollen gets, the uh, fuzz gets in your eyes and it really hurts. But it's a very beautiful flower. Another very interesting flower out our way is this one, which Jane Panero and, you know, the Interpretive Center at the Poppy Reserve is called the Jane S. Panero Interpretive Center. Now, uh, she called these little boutonnieres uh, and they're dainty little flower, about three inches high, but when you see them in masses, and you can see them between here and uh, California City covering the ground, uh, they look like snow on the ground. The one that's called snow, evening snow, is this one. And uh, you drive up uh, Willow Springs Road toward Tehachapi, you go up there about noon or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you won't see anything on the hills. But you come back about 6 o'clock in the evening, and here the whole hillside is white. 
with this evening snow, and it'll bloom all night. The other day I was out at uh, Gorman, and here a bunch of them were out there still blooming by 10 o'clock in the morning, which really surprised me. These flowers are aliens because they have not always existed here. They came with the mission fathers from the Mediterranean area, and they're called Fillory. Actually, they have a great many common names, and generally it's based on the seed pod that they produce. Uh, off fillery means needle in Spanish. Uh, they are sometimes the kids put two together and call them scissors. When uh, the seed pods dry, they have a tail on them, and uh, you spit on them and the tail unwinds. They call them clocks. Uh, they're also called heron's bill. You can see a long bill like figure here. Uh, they're good for uh, sheep and goat food, and sometimes they just cover the ground, a very thick carpet on the ground of these beautiful purple flowers. These pretty little flowers and clusters here are called globigilia. They're made up of a multitude of very tiny five-petal flowers. Uh, diameter is not more than inch, inch and a quarter across. But a lot of times they grow in great masses up on Gorman Post Road, Johnson Hill Road, um, mainly in the western part of Antelope Valley. What's the difference between a wildflower and a weed? Well, it's a matter of attitude, I guess, because if the plant is growing someplace you don't want it to grow, it's probably a weed, no matter whether it's a poppy or whatever. Uh, one particular weed I consider is this fiddle neck. You can see why they call it a fiddle neck if you examine it up close, because it has flowers in these little fiddle necks. Uh, why do I consider this a weed? Well, first of all, when it dries up, these little pricklies on the stem are really painful when you touch them. But even more is that the effect that uh, it has on animals. When cattle eat this plant when, after it's dried up, the seeds are little nutlets which uh, cause cirrhosis of the liver and uh, can be a real problem if uh, they grow in uh, alfalfa fields where the farmer bales the hay. Another mustard family plant, which the leaves were eaten by early pioneers and by the Indians, uh, this desert candle. The interesting part about this plant is the red part at the top, the wine color, are not flowers. Those are the buds. The flowers are down the stalks and they open up. Uh, these are hollow. You can squeeze them. And uh, they, some years, in great years, they'll grow in great masses. But uh, I'm afraid this year we probably won't even see any out there at High Vista. This is a gourd used by the Spanish to wash clothing as a detergent, but the problem with it was that in the roots and the gourd itself you, they used, the problem with it, you had to rinse and rinse and rinse your clothing because if you didn't, you'd get dermatitis. But <clears throat> has a squash-like blossom and this kind of gourd. Now, if you're botanizing it, 40 miles an hour and you see a field of these laying out there after the frost has come and all these little orange uh, things out there, you'd, that's the reason they got the name called mock orange. But we know it as buffalo gourd or chili coyote. These little flowers are called forget-me-nots and they're in a family that are very hard to determine which species each of them are. Again, you have to have a a seed, a microscope, and so forth. Now, some of these will have red roots. And the, when the roots are red, and we recommend you don't pull them up but to examine them, but when the roots are red, they're called popcorn flower. 
and the roots were used by the Indians to as a dye for their various weaving. There are many desert shrubs that put on a very showy, beautiful flower. One of them is this linear leaf golden bush. It's in the sunflower family. Okay, in the sunflower family, botanists consider that each of these flower pods is not just one single flower, but these what we would call petals are called ray flowers, and the center part they call cone flowers. Now some flowers of the sunflower family have only ray flowers and some have only cone flowers. Uh, there are some related species to this golden bush, uh, the golden head for example, which has uh, one or two ray flowers but mostly the cone flowers in the middle. Uh, it's a very beautiful group of shrubs. One of the first flowers to come out in the spring after the Joshua's start blooming are these very beautiful masses of gold fields. They're very tiny flower but they grow in great masses. I've counted them and uh, sometimes there are 500 to 800 blossoms per square foot. They're about three inches high. Some are even less and uh, they have a very wonderful perfume when you're walking out in them if the wind isn't blowing, but unfortunately the wind blows an awful lot in the wildflower fields. When you're hiking in the hill country, it's always so wonderful when you come up on these patches of little baby blue eyes. They have such a wonderful blue outer petals and white inside. Up in the Tehachapi area, you'll find them much larger than this, but much closer to the ground, but with the same beautiful blue. This is Yucca whippoli, or commonly known as our Lord's Candle. It's found uh, both in the foothill areas and uh, throughout the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, for the Indian, it was truly a supermarket. This is a leaf of the uh, yucca whippoli, or our Lord's candle, found in uh, quite profusion at the base of the stone. Uh, it's long and has this very sharp point on it. Uh, it was used uh, many ways by the in Indians or Native Americans. They would pound this and the root to make a nice green soap, but primarily they used it for fibers. And they would run it across a rock like this until it broke up into numerous fibers such as this. And they would pull these out and get four strands in each hand. And uh, they would twist this way and wrap this way. So they would twist and wrap, twist and wrap so that very soon they got quite a very, very strong piece of cordage. They would also use this for weaving uh, loincloths and uh, it, it's very, very strong material. Clumps of leaves like this might sit out in the desert woodland for a year, two years, five years, six years, and all of a sudden in the spring of the year, April or first part of May, they'll shoot up these young stalks, which may grow as much as six inches a day. Uh, when the stalks were this size, the Indians and the Spanish would cut them, peel them, and uh, eat the insides or they would barbecue them. They're high in carbohydrates and uh, very tasty apparently. But uh, when they get older, like the stalks behind them here, uh, they are poisonous and uh, unfit to eat the, the meat of the stalk. The Native American would harvest the petals and uh, put them in their uh, watertight baskets with water and uh, hot stones and cook them. 
uh, which apparently is a real delicacy. But it's an interesting flower. If you look at each individual flower, you see that there are six petals. And uh, the leaves, the long, narrow leaves, puts them in the lily family. Uh, also, it's interesting how these plants are pollinated. Their pronuba moth will lay its eggs in the center part and uh, in so doing will pollinate it. Now, without the yucca, the pronuba moth could not exist. The yucca is pollinated by other insects, but the main pollinator is the pronuba moth. This is a cross section of the uh, dead uh, yucca stalk. And you can see by examining that it is quite soft. You can stick your thumbnail in it quite easily. But uh, <clears throat> most of the time when you cut these open, you can find very good evidence of uh, the larva from the pronuba moth, which uh, eats its way through the stalk. And it's very seldom can you ever find a complete clear section of the material. As the flowers matured, they formed uh, large green seed pods. And the Indians would pick these seed pods green and dry them. They would grind it into a powder and uh, wet them and make wet the powder and make them in, into little cakes. Uh, the, if they were left on the stalk, the birds and the small animals would eat most of the seeds. After the seeds mature, the whole plant, including the stalk, dies. And uh, you can see these ghostly uh, stalks throughout the foothills. But as time goes on, they will disintegrate and fall over. And uh, if you examine the leave, dead leaves, you can see the nice little fibers that are within the leaves. Uh, these make very nice little brushes if you'll take out the solid part of it. Speaking of the yucca, when I was a boy in high school, my cousin and I used to hike a lot up in the hills above uh, Pearland near Barrel Springs. And one June day we were out hiking for quite a while and we got pretty thirsty. And uh, so we had heard about the Indians uh, cutting open the barrel cactus for water and we thought, well, maybe we should try one of these yuccas. Well, the yuccas by that time had gone to seed and they were still green. But uh, anyway, we chopped down a stalk and peeled back the bark and got the inside of it. It was quite good. It was sweet and uh, had a good taste to it. But the more we ate, the more dehydrated we got. And by the time I got home, I was one of the sickest little kids you ever saw. The Joshua tree is a symbol of the Mojave Desert. It grows only in the confounds of the Mojave Desert, extending sometimes up into Arizona and Utah and Nevada. But in the main, growing here in California. The botanical name of the Joshua tree is Yucca brevifolia. Brevifolia means short leaves. These needle-like things on the Joshua tree are considered to be the leaves. Uh, in uh, February and March, uh, sometimes they put out a flower head at the end of the branches or at the top of these small trees. Uh, the uh, species of Joshua tree on the western part of the Mojave are the Yucca brevifolia brevifolia, whereas the ones on the eastern side are the Yucca brevifolia jaegerani. The over there, the blossoms will open up. Uh, here they remain closed until they send the seed pod out of the blossom. After the seed pods of the Joshua tree mature, uh, they're knocked off of the a uh, bunch by birds, uh, lizards, and so forth. So leaving this stalk, and at this point is where the tree branches. Uh, later on, maybe a year, two years, three years later, uh, 
this part right here will branch. The seeds are eaten by a lot of birds, uh, cactus wren, uh, the night lizard, uh, all kind of animals uh, prize the seeds of the Joshua tree. And uh, they're lined up in the seed pods like little watermelon seed. And for that reason, uh, not very many of the Joshua trees are given an up of the seeds are given an opportunity to germinate. So that a great many times the new Joshua tree is cloned. In other words, it comes up from a rhizome off of the mother tree. Joshua trees grow very, very slowly. As the leaves die, they fold down around the trunk of the tree, and they may be like that for maybe 50 years until the leaves fall off and you see this what appears to be a bark, uh, so that the old, old trees will have this very rough surface on the trunk. This is a piece of a Joshua tree limb. When it was living, uh, it would be quite heavy because it stores the sap in the uh, center part. But once it's fallen and dries out, it's quite lightweight. And uh, examining, you can see that it's quite fibrous inside. There are no tree rings so that you cannot tell the age of the tree from that. Uh, it's more like uh, the inside of a palm tree. The Joshua bloom will come out in this rocket-like bud, very colorful uh, with the bracts on the side. And as it matures, it will develop this head. Uh, you can see the uh, little flowers coming out behind these colorful bracts. Uh, Joshua trees, some of them do not bloom every year. Uh, in past years where we've had very cold winters, and lots of rain, uh, we get uh, a bloom on the end of almost every limb of the Joshua tree. Uh, the following year, we probably won't have any blossoms. Uh, some years, uh, we'll have a 50% uh, bloom, uh, which is usual. But it's not unusual at all to have no blooms. Uh, when a Joshua tree is injured either by insects or by the wind, it tends to heal itself by forming this very hard material which we called petrified yucca. It really isn't petrified, and the best explanation I can find for it is yet from Jaeger, who says that the Joshua tree takes the silicon from the sand through the roots and solution and uh, forms it around the injured part. When I was a boy, we used to prize this as good fuel for our cook stoves. And we would go out in the desert and load up this stuff, and it would burn like coal. Uh, there's no way of telling the age of the Joshua tree from uh, cutting the trunk or doing core samples. Uh, I've had estimates that of uh, 800 to 6,000 years that... Uh, a Joshua tree might grow, but really, uh, no one really knows. The trees out in the eastern Mojave are somewhat different. You'll notice the shape of this one. They branch much early from the base. Most of the limbs are pointing up. Uh, Jane Panero had said, came up with a legend by the Indian, said when an Indian dies, he soul goes to a Joshua tree and for those limbs that are pointing down indicate his bad deeds and those that are pointing up his good deeds. So I take it that we had a lot of bad Indians out this way because out in the eastern Mojave, most of the branches are pointing up. This is the very beautiful flower, the desert four o'clock, a uh, giant four o'clock has a really beautiful flower. It blooms late in June. And we might call this a, a farewell to spring, but instead we call this one, which covers large hills in the Gorman Pass, uh, up at Tehachapi, down Bokeh Canyon. And it's a very pretty little godisha called, uh, whoop, 
uh, called Farewell to Spring. And I'll leave you with the thought that take, when you go out looking for wildflowers, take nothing but photographs, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. Thank you very much.